I, you know, I, I share the realist intuitions. I understand, yeah. I think, what people are getting at when they say that this, this quality of yellow, this quality of pain, this what it's likeness. And I just think, and, and I agree with the, 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 the radical people, the property dualists and the substance yeah. dualists, that I can't really make sense of that yeah. being the same thing as just a pattern of neuron firing. It just, it just, the, the way I conceptualize the way I think of the, the feel, hmm. it seems too different. Yeah. from whatever the neuroscientists might describe for me to accept that they're the same thing. Um, now, one way to go is to say, okay, they really are different things. And the other way to go is to say, I'm misconceptualizing it. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedecase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest questions in philosophy, theology, nature, and life with experts in those fields. I really love thinking about cool stuff, and you're invited to come think with me. Today, we have another special episode. I have with me Dr. Keith Frankish. He is an honorary reader at the University of Sheffield, a visiting research fellow at the Open University in the UK, and an adjunct professor uh, with the Brain and Mind program at the University of Crete. Um, I hope there's more and more we can keep going. He's the editor of Cambridge University Press series uh, in philosophy of mind. So this is going to be a really fun one. I love mind uh research mind studies brain stuff it's it's going to be really cool and he's an illusionist when it comes to consciousness so we're going to get into what that means like uh i'm, I'm really excited for it before we jump in though i want to thank everyone on patreon for making this podcast happen if you enjoy this podcast if you've benefited benefited from it please consider becoming a patreon patron you can find the link in the description wherever you're listening to this podcast whether watching or listening that would be huge. I, I really appreciate the support. I would love to do this full time. And I only need like a billion more patrons and then I could fly out to Crete and have this interview in person or this conversation in person. So um, seriously, though, if you guys like it, please support it. Um, all right. Without further ado, let's jump in. Let's talk about illusionism and consciousness and theories of mind. Here we go. Dr. Frankish, thanks so much for uh, making the time for me here. Hi, Parker. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so um, just uh, initially, you're are you in Crete? I am in Heraklion in Crete, yes. Oh, awesome. Okay, well, so maybe you can confirm for us, like, are all Cretans uh, liars? Is that? Well, what can I say? <laughs> um, uh, being a Cretan, uh, you can't really trust <laughs> either answer, can you? Well, are, are you are you a Cretan yourself? I do have Greek citizenship, so wow. uh, and I live in Crete, so um, I, um, I I guess I can I can I can claim that. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, so uh, for folks who don't know, that's the the uh, liar paradox, um, and it comes up uh, in the Bible as well from uh, Saint Paul, which is hilarious. So, uh, Doctor Frankish, you 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 are a co-host uh, of the Mind Chat podcast with uh, Doctor Philip Goff. I. I'm curious, like, how how did you get into philosophy, and then how did you get into philosophy of mind type stuff? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really know. It's, it's, hmm. I, it, I I I kind of drifted into it, I suppose. Hmm. I was my originally at school. My interests were mainly in in, in the sciences, um, but then uh, I spent a lot of time. Uh, uh, reading, um, thinking, reading literature and philosophy, and getting much more interested in the in the in the humanities generally. And I think I settled on philosophy as a way of combining those two things, hmm. of combining the, I guess, the inquiring spirit of science with the more reflective human. Uh, side of of literature and the arts and so on, and I felt that philosophy promised to do that. Promised to give us a way of reconciling these two pictures of what we are: the picture of the world, the science paints it, and the picture uh, of of ourselves as art and literature and so on. And yeah. self reflection presents it. And I felt maybe philosophy could combine both of those perspectives. Yeah. Um, but I also, I just enjoyed reading it. I really enjoyed reading philosophy. Um, I found it absorbing, perhaps, perhaps in the way that maybe a chess game is absorbing. I found it, I enjoyed 
following through the arguments and trying, and it was it was a challenge at first. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's 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 something that it takes time to learn, just as chess does. But I found it a stimulating challenge. Um, so that's probably how I got into philosophy, the philosophy of mind. I, I think I'd, I, I'd always been fascinated by, by, by psychology and uh, by, um, also I was, I've always been quite an introspective person. I've always thought a lot about my own experience, about, um, uh, about, my, about my, uh, my own thinking processes. Mm -hmm. What exactly am I doing <laughs> when I'm thinking? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm remembering associations uh, occurring in my mind. How is this, what's actually happening here? When I make a decision, I would think about you know, when I make a decision, what, is, what exactly is happening there? Is it something that's happening? In, is it something I'm doing, like signing a check or something, or is it mm. something that's happening in me? And how does that decision affect my actions? Um, because I've decided, does that mean I'm going to do it? Well, no, sadly it doesn't. So, what is the relation between deciding to do something and actually doing it? Mm. And then, of course, consciousness, which is, uh, I think. Everyone will agree it's, it's 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 the most in many ways the most puzzling aspect of the mind. Yeah. So I, it's natural, I think, from those with those influences, with that direction of travel, that I should end up thinking about consciousness. Yeah, that that sounds right. I today it sounds like I I uh, I'm I'm a, like thirty, so I don't know a whole ton about the history, but from what I heard from, you know, John Searle's lectures and stuff, consciousness used to be like kind of a taboo thing. Wasn't that cool? But now today you, you tell someone, Oh, I study consciousness. It sounds awesome. It sounds so cool. So it's like a, it seems like it's come, it's come around where now it's a really cool thing to be studying. I think it's, it's, I think that's right. And it's partly, I think, because from the point of view of scientists, scientists just didn't have the tools to study consciousness. Mm. Um, uh, one thing that has changed this is the development of imaging techniques so that yeah. we can, we can map in real time what's happening in the brain, at least at some some uh, rather very coarse grained level. We can map what's happening in the brain, which bits of the brain are active, when people are engaged in certain tasks and doing certain and having certain conscious experiences. So we've got some, it, 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 and the many different sorts of of, of imaging and and um, uh, recording techniques. And until scientists had that, they really didn't have a way of 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 uh, any tools for thinking about consciousness what they had they had of course um uh, uh study uh, lesion studies and studies from uh, based on 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 uh, 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 brain injuries and brain disease and we could see how certain uh, uh, aspects of consciousness were were damaged or lost by damage to the brain which reinforced the tight connect the, the, the tight connection between the mind and brain but to study what's what's happening in the course of uh, uh normal unimpaired um uh, conscious experience so it wasn't until the really the 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 80s that we started to get these techniques mm. um and i think to some extent the same was true of philosophers philosophers didn't have um good um well, arguably we still don't have uh good theoretical frameworks for thinking about con about consciousness yeah um and in the absence of that, they focused on things that seemed a bit more tractable, a bit easier to to, to approach. Uh, things like the nature of uh, belief and thought and um, mental representation and these sorts of things. But now, yes, we um, arguably we we still a long way from having the tools we need, yeah. but we have enough to 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 start to start a good debate going, and that's, that's been going, I guess, since the nineteen nineties in in really vigorous form, both in philosophy and in in, in, in science. Yeah, so yes, it's an exciting time to be to be thinking about this. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess I hadn't thought about the connection between the the neuroscience and um, the different tool conceptual tools as well, kind mm. of coming up together. Do, um, I wonder, is there? A, so sometimes people talk about first philosophy and, and philosophy being you know its own its own domain, um, mm. or, or having its own domain separate from science. Is there a first philosophy of mind that neuroscience doesn't get to touch that we? That the philosophers of mind get to sit back and say, "Hey, look, like I will cede to you a lot, but there's this area over here that this is my expertise, and I do offer something to you." Uh, I don't think there's something. I don't think there's a first philosophy of mind. There may be in other areas. There may be uh, other areas where you can, uh, where, where perhaps in thinking about abstract 
objects, um, for example. But I think philosophers have something to contribute here, but I don't think they get to set the uh, the framework for the debate. Mm. I think they can help to articulate a framework, a theoretical framework, based on experimental work. They can look at a lot of experimental work and help to synthesize a framework mm. and, and see the big picture in a way that scientists some, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, well, they're often discouraged from doing they do, yeah. do detailed experimental work, don't, don't speculate. Well, philosophers can speculate, and, but I don't see they have any special authority in the speculation. Certainly, I don't think they have any authority that derives uh, from things like analysis of language and concepts sure. or from pure introspection. Some people, particularly in relation to consciousness, think that we do. Yeah. The first-person perspective, our perspective on our own experiences, what it's like to undergo uh, various experiences, pain, say, or pleasure, we could equally talk about. Um, they think that that establishes certain foundations, certain basic data for, for a, a theory of consciousness that science cannot touch. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't accept that. I think that's wrong. And in a way, that's the heart of my position. Yeah. Uh, I don't trust introspection in that way. I mean, introspection is great. Introspection gives us a lot of interesting information. Okay. Give, the fact that we're disposed to say certain things, to describe our experiences in a certain way, that's very, very interesting. Yeah. And a theory of consciousness needs to explain that. Why? Does it seem that way to us? Why do, are we inclined to say these things about our own experience? Very important. But we shouldn't take those things as gospel, as authoritative. The fact that it seems a certain way to me isn't a guarantee that it really is that way. I could be misconceptualizing my own experience. Yeah. And that is really the heart of my view of, of, of the matter. So, um, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure... I think I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure I've heard you say talk about this before, but could you does that does that include all experiences? Like could you be wrong that you're in pain? No, uh, I don't look um we can recognize our experiences when we have them. Okay. okay. So uh I, I, I don't doubt that I mean there may be certain um uh, uh, uh anomalous cases, certain cases of certain kinds of um, agnosias or whatever. But, it's so good. The, the philosopher in your head just pointing yeah, to counter examples. Yeah, That's so wait, great. Qualify that. Don't, don't just say yeah. that without qualifying it. Yeah. <laughs> I do that all the time in these talks. You'll see me as I'm talking. I When I slow down, it's because this little guy in my head is saying, hang on. Hang right. On. Anyway, <laughs> so so in general, yeah, we are we are very good at recognizing what kind of, of uh, experiences we're having. Uh, and we have labels for these experiences for, you know, so we can communicate about them and say, I'm in pain. And you know what that means. I know what that means. It's that state I'm in that that uh, uh, that I uh, it's one state I don't like being in. That state that's normally caused by something bad having happened to my body that uh, uh, produces all kinds of other reactions in me that makes me perhaps anxious and fearful and stressed and uh, that I, I want to, I very much want to stop and so on. You know all about that about pain. I know all about about pain. I say I'm in pain. Right. So we're communicating fine, um, and. These reports are, except in the most strangest of circumstances, are generally authoritative. If I say I'm in pain, then I'm in that state yeah. uh, that we call pain. If I say I'm tasting uh, something, I, I, what I'm tasting, what I'm, um, uh, the, the food that, that I'm uh, uh, eating tastes too salty, then again, you know, I'm in that state that I'm tasting salt. Now, so I, I, I'm not challenging people's self descriptions of their own experiences. I'm not saying they're misclassifying them. Okay. That they think they're seeing things when they're not, or they think they're in pain when they're not. No, no. What I'm challenging is their interpretation of, or at least what I'm a, a certain interpretation. I don't sure it's the everyday one that at least philosophers often have of what it means to be in pain. Mm. Okay. So now, what I'm where you could be wrong, right? you, you couldn't be wrong with those caveats about being the fact that you're in pain at the moment but you could be wrong about what pain actually is mm. now here's one example suppose you suppose you believe that as, as many people have believed and many people still believe that you have an immaterial soul yeah. okay which is distinct from your body although it's somehow okay. um, uh, uh, associated with your body linked to your body in some way yeah and you might think that things like pains 
and pleasures and other experiences are not states of your body at all. The body isn't really in pain. The body is just having certain neurons, uh, 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 pain receptors stimulated and uh, electrochemical signals traveling around and neurons doing stuff, but it's not really in pain. The pain actually occurs in your soul. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the body, the physical body sends these, sends messages somehow to your soul and your soul is where the pain is. Um, and similarly for all other experiences. So you think that these states you're describing, the states that we all agree you actually uh, enter, the states of pain and pleasure, and seeing and feeling, and you believe these are states of an immaterial substance that's mm -hmm. separate from your body. A lot of people have believed that. Yeah. And a lot of people, I guess, people still believe that. But I think they're wrong. So when okay. they're having that pain, so so I am a, du a dualist myself. So I I stub my toe and I think um, my soul is in pain. And so I'm not wrong about the actual uh, phenomena of of pain that I'm experiencing. But I am wrong about what I think it, that what I think it is. Yes, you're not wrong about being in the state we all call pain. Yeah, but you could be wrong. I'm saying I'm not. It doesn't even matter whether you are wrong or not at the moment. The point is right. that's a further claim. That's yeah. you're saying, A, I'm in that state, the one we call pain. And secondly, I think that state is a state of an immaterial soul. Now, yeah. it could be that you're right about the first, but wrong about the second. Right. Okay. And that's essentially how I see this thing that I don't want to correct people's descriptions of what states they're in. <laughs> yeah. I want to correct their conception of what those states actually are. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people have a, I'm not, now, I was going to say a philosophical view of, 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 of what pain is. And, and I think it is certainly influenced by, strongly influenced by a philosophical tradition. But, but I think it's one that a lot of people come up with for themselves through doing a bit of self-reflection and doing a bit of um, uh, everyday philosophy. Yeah. Um, but they, they come up with a theory of what these things are, which so which seems so compelling to them and so obvious mm -hmm. that they don't see that it is a theory. And they don't see that it can be questioned. Yeah. And really, the first thing I want to do, the, the central thing I want to do, is to get people to see that it is a theory and that it can be questioned. And that we shouldn't just take it for granted. Because the problem is, if you do take this view for granted, then you um, put consciousness outside the scope of scientific explanation. Yeah. Now, maybe it is outside the scope of scientific explanation, but we shouldn't just... You know, rush to do to put it there because yeah. we have this strong uh, common sense uh, uh, intuition that it is. Yeah, I was gonna. I was just gonna mention that that uh, depending on who you're talking to, it'll either be uh, folk understanding or common sense understanding. If you're a proponent, it's well, it's common sense, and if you're not, well, that's what the folk folks think. But you, <laughs> you did a great job of navigating that without without uh, poisoning the well against anybody. Uh, I, yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's there's a, there's a there's very interesting questions about the nature of our intuitions, both about about the mind and about many other philosophical topics. A lot of philosophers, um, particularly you know, in the in the analytic tradition, have spent a lot of time analyzing concepts and as, often assuming that they're these concepts are ones that everybody shares, and that if they analyze this concept, this shows at very least how we are. Um, uh, how we have to think about things. They assume that we have to, that these concepts are something that either, that, that, that are either perhaps innate or that somehow they're the, 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 the only ones that our minds can really work with or that they're culturally universal or whatever. And so in understanding, in analyzing the concepts, we're analyzing our basic ways of thinking about the world that, are, that we, that, the, 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 the conceptual world we live in. But I think that it's increasingly evident that, that many of the, um, uh, of, of the concepts that philosophers have analyzed have been rather culturally localized ones. They've been Western hmm. ones. Um, and it's simply not true. And, and often there've been ones um, that uh, are particularly fostered within a certain kind of Western educational system. And they're just not as wide, not as universal as they think at all. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I've heard yeah. that I've heard that used um, by by substance dualists to say, look, like everyone in the world uh, historically has believed in souls and spirits, disembodied persons that can come back, and mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a really fun one to play. I really like I really like that because 
we're broadening out to other other cultures. You know, sometimes we get mm -hmm. I, I get focused really in, on Western the Western canon. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting way to think and say, well, what what do most people think? Okay, is it possible most people are wrong? Absolutely. Is it possible that most people are onto something? Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, and it, I, I, and also there's there's also a, a, an in between position as well, which is that maybe they they are wrong, but they're kind of onto something, but not what yeah. they think they're onto. Sure, sure. <laughs> maybe there's something about the nature of the human mind that disposes us to believe in something like substance dualism, mm -hmm. ways we think about ourselves that tempts us to believe in that way, even though it's not true. Okay. So we are still capturing something important about human psychology, something mm -hmm. that needs explaining. Uh, and that that's so that takes this 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 thought this idea seriously in the sense that we're not just saying oh these people are just confused they've just got this silly uh, folk out, the sort of naive childish idea and so it's, uh, they're onto something they're they're expressing something important yeah or maybe something that's quite um, meaningful and significant to them and that they fear perhaps um, perhaps rightly losing okay. Uh, but there is a possibility that maybe we can we can reconceptualize what's happening in a way that does justice to those intuitions and perhaps even to their sense of the importance of those intuitions without taking them seriously as contradicting something that that, that, um, uh, that, that science says or constructing a metaphysical framework around them that is that that's we don't need to to take them so seriously that we mm. transform our view of reality to fit them. Yeah. Well, we can take them seriously within uh, uh, a more naturalistic uh, framework. Yeah. So some people might say, "Well, you know, uh, I hear you that you you want to be uh, nice to these folks, but you've you've called your term, uh, you've termed your your view illusionism. So it sounds like a, a kind of a negative thing." In this mm -hmm. in this paper, illusionism as a theory of consciousness, you in the in the intro you explain why you say illusionism and it's not like a, it's not a nasty term it's not being mm -hmm. mean to people but the alternatives are are not that great either um can you just uh can you lay out like what what do you mean by illusionism as uh, mm -hmm. as a theory of consciousness and then we can keep going here mm -hmm. you know i do mean it positively i love illusions um i'm thinking <laughs> of i'm thinking of um things like stage illusions i love them yeah. i love the way that uh they can seem so powerful and so amazing and so uplifting mm. um it seems like the, the magician on stage is transcending the uh the ordinary limits of physical existence and that's kind of wonderful and <laughs> fun and terrific and i really really like that okay. um uh, and of course when you find out how it's done it's always so disappointing mm. because it's just a trick and and it never it's it, 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 the actual mechanism always disappoints you never 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 justifies the the sense of of, uh, of wonder you felt at the effect itself right. um and and i suppose in a way a lot of art is like that fiction poetry hmm. drama uh, painting and so on it's using techniques and tricks to create a certain effect hmm. on the reader, the viewer, um, uh, the audience. And so in a way, it's a sort of illusion too, but it's again, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, potent, powerful illusion. It's one of the most greatest expressions of the, the human spirit. Yeah. Artists. So I, I'm absolutely not, don't mean to, um, um, uh, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense. So I want to acknowledge the wonder uh, of consciousness as it as we're inclined to conceptualize it, while at the same time saying that in the end maybe it is a sort of trick of the brain, mm -hmm. and uh, so how tend to characterize what's the nature of the illusion? Well, uh, when you when we reflect upon our own experience. We most of the time that we don't. We're just living in the world, and our experience is just of a world out there that's solid, three-dimensional. It's out there. It's 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 real. It's independent of us. 
all the qualities we're aware of, the colors, sounds, tastes, and so on, they're all out there in the things, in the, the objects we're looking at, in the, the things that are vibrating or whatever, the food that we're <laughs> tasting and so on. Yeah. It's all out there. It's solid. It's independent of us. Pains and so on, they're all, in a sense, out there in our bodies. They're all, they all seem like solid, like features of the solid physical world. But then, if you start to reflect a bit and you think about cases where uh, you've uh, uh, had, well, think about dreams, think about hallucinations, think about these kinds of visual illusions where things aren't the way they seem, think about after images and things. And it seems you can have these same sort of experiences without the things really being there. Yeah. And so this tends, this tends to sort of turn it more inwards. And we think, well, really what seems to be happening is that these experiences are actually occurring in me. And it's the, 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 the colors and the sounds and the tastes and so on are really in me. And they're being produced there by whatever's out there in the world. But they're actually really in me, in my mind somehow. So when I say that the, the cup here is red, there's something out there in the world, some feature of the world that is affecting me through my visual system and it's but it's producing the a kind of mental redness which is what i'm really aware of and right. i could be aware of that mental redness even without the feature of the world as when i dream and so on. so this tends to sort of turn us inward and get a picture of the mind as a sort of duplicate as it were of the qualities of the world in our in our heads yeah and this uh, and this seems to go along also with the idea that we have a certain perspective on the world. We're, we're sort of located here behind our eyes somehow. And mm -hmm. there, there seems to be this private world in here somehow. A world of packed with all these colors and sounds and tastes and all this richness that we normally ascribe to the world seems to somehow be packed into this in, inner world. Yeah. And that's where all the, the real <laughs> action seems to be. And the world itself sort of is kind of, colorless and inert and whatever and it's described by uh, the, 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 the equations of, of physics or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so now we have this picture. Now, first of all, I don't think this is a common sense picture. The common sense picture is that it's all out there, that colors are out there. Right. It's not that it's in here. But we've... Well, Dr. Uh, Frank, is, yeah. is this mapping onto, um, like, the manifest in image and the scientific image? Is it, mm. is, it, is it also, like, it seems like it's in that area, but also, like, if you push it too far, it's like the noumenal phenomenal distinction. Yes, no, I think I think both are aspects of what I'm um, I'm I'm, I'm uh, gesturing at here. Yes, okay. and the manifest image from the scientific image. The manifest image is the world, as it were, as it, as, as our senses present it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of features that we can detect and and uh, uh, the way they they present themselves to us and the significance they seem to have. And then the scientific image is the, the image of the world as as presented by 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 the natural sciences, um, uh, which is the, the, the most basic, it comes down to uh, uh, fundamental particles and so on, in, uh, right. uh, uh, operating in accordance with universal laws. Um, and then the, the 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 other one you mentioned, the noumenal and the phenomenal. The phenomenal again being the way uh, the world of appearances, the world uh, 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 as it. Um, as we as we sense it, yeah. and the noumenal world being the world as it is in itself, which perhaps is not even accessible even to scientific um, uh, uh, description. It's 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 the reality that I mean the scientific description is extrapolated, I suppose, from our sense experience. That the, the the noumenal world is the world as it really is in itself, beyond all of that, and it's a reality. Yeah, that yeah. I thought even the manifest and the scientific both are kind of subsumed in the phenomenal, uh, the phenomena. And, if, and, and the noumenal is like the thing we can't even touch. Even if we wanted to use our scientific operations, they 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 still are presented to us in a certain way. Mm, yes, yes, yes. I, I'm I'm a bit I'm a, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of the, the value of that way of thinking. But yeah. um, but anyway, but, but I think it, it it they are both I think developments of this sort of this line of thought that I was suggesting, which mm -hmm. is that it begins with uh, we begin with a sense of ourselves as being just. In, in the world and perception is just uh, putting us in the world. What we're aware of is, is not our experience of the world. We're just aware of the world. Mm. It's just vividly there for us as, um, 
colorful and um, uh, frightening and, and tasty and uh, painful and whatever. It's, 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 it's and I, 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 I think that's probably what, what animal life is like. It's just a vivid world of, 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 of things. Yeah. And the animal is just a thing in these worlds immediately um, in touch with them. But once we step, we are more reflective creatures. We have language. We can talk about our own experiences and we, Come to this picture of it really all, all, all the significance all the um the the, the 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 qualities of the world really being in our own minds um and then of course once you start to think that way uh, one natural way to go fairly natural way to go i suppose is to some sort of substance dualism to say well of this, this 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 mind this private mind it's it's not a part of the physical world at all it's something mm. it's so different from the physical world mm. um and it's so private it's not something anyone else can see and it's it's somehow connected to my body because what happens in it is affected by what happens to my body if you kick my my shin then something happens and then i feel pain in this private mental world and similarly if i make a decision in my private mental world then that affects my body but um that's such different things um that they they, they have to be distinct kinds of um distinct substances distinct worlds really mm -hmm. um now um in the 20th century that view largely fell out of favor with scientists and philosophers partly because it became obvious that there were such intimate connections between the mind and the brain yeah that disturbance to the brain could affect very specific mental faculties um um, it could affect particular aspects, not just particular senses, but particular aspects of particular senses. It could knock out just things like detection of motion, for instance. You could still see, but you couldn't see the uh, movement. It could it could knock out recognition of faces. Uh, it could lose specific kinds of memories and so on. And they all, all of these mental aspects of our mental world seem tied to specific uh, 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 processes in the brain. Yeah. And... So it became harder and harder to maintain that there were really two separate things here. And so one response is saying, no, it's just the brain. There's just the brain doing all its complicated stuff that it does, massively complicated stuff. And it's so easy to underestimate the complexity of the brain. The brain is something like 86 billion, consists of 86 billion neurons yeah. and, and other structures, um, which are connected together, interconnected in uh, unimaginably complex ways. Um, and uh, carrying out uh, processes of which we have, and they're bathed in a, in a soup of uh, uh, um, hormones and other um, mm -hmm. um, uh, neuro, um, 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 neurotransmitters and so on, which, all, which can affect the activity. And we understand this at such a sketchy level at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and one way, of going is, one way of going here is to say, when we understand what the brain is doing in a, in a much, uh, in, a, in a better way, we will sense to, we cease to lose our miss. Uh, we, we will sorry, we will lose our sense of mystery here. We'll begin yeah. to understand why we why 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 there seems to be this inner world. There's something distinct when there actually isn't. Now the other way to go here is to say, okay, um, uh, we're not going to be substance dualists because that's that's too much. That's too far. That's that's going that's going too far. But still, there is an aspect to us to our existence to our minds that is not accounted for by what the brain does. Yeah. It does depend on the brain. The brain has to be there and working and doing its stuff, but somehow the brain is producing something extra. Yeah. Is this, um, is this conservative realism? Like are you, you give no, this kind of taxonomy. This is, this is, this is what I call radical realism. Actually. Oh, this it's is radical still radical. Because it okay. goes beyond uh, what uh, the resource the, 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 the resources of, uh, standard cognitive science and neuroscience and so on. It says, okay. no, we need to we need to extend our conception of what the science needs to extend its conception of what there is in the world. Because yeah. science, neuroscience say, um, or at least a future um, more refined version of it, will be able to explain everything that the brain is doing yeah. eventually. But it won't be able to explain this extra aspect that the brain is producing. Okay. This, so, so this so, is a form of property dualism. So radical, radical realism. Um, uh, someone who is taking these things radically uh, as real, that that encompasses both substance dualism and property dualism. You're saying yes, exactly. Okay, gotcha. It, All right. It's radical because it says we need to rethink the basic nature of reality. 
uh, uh, so the, the look at it like this we have all these different sciences starting with basic physics and and we have chemistry and biology and all these different and the relations between them are very complex and we have neuroscience and so on and these are kind of these are mapping the structure of the world mm -hmm. uh, mapping what's happening in in the world at, at different levels of description if you like it's a bit more complex than that but that's what we'll roughly do and when it comes to say uh, thinking about how our bodies work we accept that they can they can do it pretty well mm -hmm. uh, they can tell us how our livers work and and how our digestive system works and how our respiratory system works and so on and and they're getting better and better and better at that and eventually they'll have the full picture yeah. what about neuroscience well the same go for that will it tell us everything that our, uh, our brains do and thereby everything that there is to know the radical uh, realist says no it won't there's something else uh, to be told. There's the story about this, 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 this private inner world, mm -hmm. this world of of, 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 of of private sensation and feeling and qualities, which won't be accounted for by neuroscience, Yeah, on, on cognitive science more generally. There's a, a, another aspect to reality, a further aspect that isn't being mapped by these, by the existing sciences. Yeah. And so we need to make a radical move of extending science in some way to encompass this private subjective will now they don't say generally now um one one version of radical realism is substance dualism that this is that this is these are that um there's a totally separate substance a totally separate thing here that could survive independently it's distinct from the brain and could survive possibly the death of the brain a more um, a le less radical but still radical view is that there is nothing distinct from the brain, but the brain is somehow doing something, producing something, yeah. giving rise to something. Something is emerging from the brain that is not accounted for in terms of brain processes itself, themselves. Yeah. Something that neuroscience itself would never um, uh, latch onto and, 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 and characterize. And so that's radical in the sense that it's holding, there's more to reality than the current scientific picture can yeah. connect can accept well and and that would include um epiphenomenalists and and um i i don't think that would include uh philip goff your, your co-host because i i don't think he would want to say that he's a but I, uh, a property dualist but it's mm -hmm. i don't know how he avoids that i guess well he, he he has a an interesting view um which is see if i, I don't want to 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 mischaracterize it the idea is he does think there is this this uh this aspect that isn't captured by the descriptions of 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 of, of the um of, of neuroscience and the uh, and, and, and cognitive science generally um he, but he doesn't think of it as something that is as it were produced by the brain or that emerges yeah. from it. he thinks of it as the inner nature of the brain itself right so you think that what neuroscience will tell us is what the, the brain is doing the, the, the operations might loosely call them information processing operations i suppose loosely like it's 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 at the most basic i suppose the brain is a control system for a body mm -hmm. and neuroscience can tell you all about what, what the brain is doing the finest detail but there's something else there and this thing that's that it doesn't tell you about is the inner nature of all of that mm -hmm. what it's like to be a brain okay so it's not something separate from the brain it's not something the okay. brain's it's not even a separate property really from okay. um, uh it's not like a, a glow that the brain is given off it's the inner nature of the brain itself mm. so the idea is that things have um a kind of public nature you can describe what they do how they interact with each other but they also have a private inner nature what yeah. they're like in themselves Mm. Okay, and that's the idea is that consciousness is this inner aspect. So it is radical in the sense that it's it's it, it's going beyond. It, we need to extend our conception of uh, reality to recognize this inner aspect. But it's not recognizing some um, separate some property that is um, uh, somehow emergent from or produced by uh, uh, the, uh, the, the properties that science describes. It's the inner nature of those same properties. Okay, so really, it's just. There's just one thing here, and it has a public aspect and a private aspect. And once you think of consciousness in that way, it becomes quite possible to think of things 
uh, inanimate things as being conscious. Right. Because if it's just the inner nature of the brain, quite apart from what the brain is actually doing, then things maybe that don't do much could have an inner nature too. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe everything has an inner nature of this kind. Maybe even the fundamental particles, electrons and positrons and so on, they have an inner nature of this kind, a very, a very simple one, a very, very, very basic one. Yeah. And maybe the inner nature of the brain uh, is uh, results from the combination of the inner natures of all the little particles that make it up. So it's a really rich inner nature because it's the combination of lots of very, very simple, basic inner natures, just as its activity is the consequence of the activity of all the little uh, uh, particles that, are, that compose it. Mm. So that leads to this view, which is Philip's view, which is panpsychism, that everything in a sense is conscious. And we get this inner nature. This inner nature isn't some added extra that you just get in uh, the brains of living creatures. It's a fundamental aspect of all of reality that just manifests itself in this in this very um, elaborate way yeah. in in the brains of living creatures. Well, so I might have an Oh, that that does still count as radical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. Because it says that that there's something that the um, that neuroscience and cognitive science misses out. That gotcha. we need to extend our picture of reality beyond uh, and be, uh, under, extend our picture of the mind beyond what they tell us. Yeah. Okay. So then. Um, who counts as uh, who counts in the camp of conservative realism? Okay, well, the, the conservative realists, and these are in a way my my real um, uh, targets, are people who um, want to say, well, there isn't anything extra. There isn't really anything extra. The neuroscience does tell us everything, but part of what it tells us is about this inner world that there really are, there really is this 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 this, this world of qualities of. Let's, let's introduce the word qualia. Qualia hmm. is a name for these mental qualities. So there, there are yellow things in the world, bananas say, and they affect our visual systems and they produce a kind of mental yellowness, which is the yellowness we're actually aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, these properties are called qualia, just which means qualities really. Um, so conservative realists say, oh yeah, of course there are qualia, of course there is this, this world of qualities that we're aware of in our minds, but these things are not anything over and above the properties of the brain. Yeah, are the, They're the same properties as those that the neuroscience describes. So when the neuroscientist describes your brain in complete detail, they are describing these mental qualities because they're just the same things. Yeah. So um, they say, yes, this, this intuitive picture is right. There really are quality of these mental qualities, but they are just physical properties, just the properties, just to say patterns of neuron firing in a certain region of the visual cortex, say. That's yeah. what, that's what a, a, a yellow quality, a yellow <laughs> mental, uh, uh, mental yellow is just activity in that region. It's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and so that's realism in that it says these, these, these things are real. They're not illusory. They're not. We're not. We're not wrong to think they exist. That these mental qualities, um, but it's conservative in that it doesn't say we need to extend to go beyond the resources of existing cognitive science or existing yeah. neuroscience, because these things really are just the same properties as those that neuroscience describes. Yeah. So it's a conservative realism, and that's I think. I mean, I'm completely with the radicals on this and right. that I just can't make sense of these two things being identical. Yeah. Th so I think like the, uh, the identity theorists, is there, is there anyone else, uh, who would fit in there? Like behaviorism's kind of passe or whatever. Uh, maybe, maybe there's still behaviorists out there, but no, I don't know. I, I would, I'm in certain, uh, certain, certain ways of understanding behaviorism, which I think are very much alive and I'm, I'm actually very supportive of, but okay. they need to be construed, um, properly. Would, would behaviorists, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming identity theorists uh, are, are in this camp. Uh, identity but, but, theorists, but I, yes. And, are um, behaviorists likewise? No, I don't think so. I think, I think behaviorists would, 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 would be more naturally allies of, of, of illusionism. Okay. Um, uh, no, it's, it's, it's more mind brain identity theorists, um, and realist mind brain identity theorists. Mm -hmm. Um, the standard strategy for the last, 30 years or so, I guess, physicalist strategy for dealing with consciousness has been what's called the, the phenomenal concept strategy or conceptual dualism. Okay, and the mm -hmm. idea here is that 
There isn't really a dualism of substances. There isn't a, a dualism of properties either. There's just one set of properties, but there's two different ways of conceptualizing them. Yeah. There's the uh, two ways of thinking of them, of representing them, if you like. There's the way that the scientists have. There's we, we, we might conceptualize this as a certain pattern of ne neuron firings in a certain very specific region of the visual cortex. And then there's the way of conceptualizing uh, them that we have introspectively when we attend to our own experience and we say, oh, it's the, the feel of seeing yellow. It's the, the quality of seeing yellow. They're both those descriptions, both those uh, um, the, the, the two concepts employed, they both converge on the same thing. Yeah. Um, and it's, so all we have is dualism of concepts, not of, of, of either substances or properties. So there's no real dualism in the world. There's just a dualism in the way we think about the world. It's like the dualism involved in thinking of Clark Kent and Superman. Right. There's no, there aren't two people, um, but there are two ways of thinking of the same person. And we don't realize they're the same because they present themselves rather differently in different contexts. And so the idea is that there's this particular brain state and it presents itself in one way to the neuroscientist and in another way to you as the person who, who's introspecting it. Yeah. But so it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I think I've come across this uh, usually in reference to uh, Frank Jackson's uh, Mary. Uh, that's a, that's a, a standard, that's one standard response to it, yes. Yeah, the, she, she, now she sees uh, red finally for the first time. My audience will know I, I had uh, Frank Jackson on last week, so oh. they should be primed, they should be primed for this. But Good. yeah, that's the, the phenomenal concept strategy. I, I don't know if that's really his. I, he talks about this similarity uh, difference uh, matrix uh, that, that we have, and now she can actually activate that and, and see different colors and stuff, but she's not learning any new knowledge. But um, so with, with phenomenal concepts, yeah, that does seem to be really popular, but you, mm. you say they're, uh, they're still conservative realists and you go in for illusionism instead. So what's wrong with these folks? I just can't make sense of the idea that uh, what people are talking about when they talk about, I, I kind of, I think I, I know I, I share the realist intuitions. I understand. Yeah. I think what people are getting at when they say that this this quality of yellow, this quality of pain, this what it's likeness, and I just think and, and I agree with the the the, the radical people, the property dualists and the substance yeah. dualists. That I can't really make sense of that yeah. being the same thing as just a pattern of neuron firing. It just it just the the way I conceptualize the way I think of the the feel. Mm. It seems too different. Yeah. from uh, the, um, uh, the what, whatever the neuroscientists might describe for me to accept that they're the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now one way to go is to say, okay, they really are different things. And the other way is to go is to say, I'm misconceptualizing it. Mm. That it's not really like that. That there's something happening in me, yeah. okay? And I'm detecting this thing happening somehow, courtesy, I suppose, of some kind of mechanisms of self-monitoring or self-modeling or something in the brain. I'm recognizing that I'm in a certain state, and it is just a neural state of some kind, but I'm misconceptualizing it. So hmm. I'm saying I'm in that state again. And you say, what state? And I say, oh, it's that, um, oh, it's, that it's just like a mm, pure sort of <laughs> feel of, of pain, you mm -hmm. know? And it's that one. Hmm. And I am picking out something that's happening, but when I conceptualize it as this pure feel, I'm misconceptualizing it. I'm taking it to, for something, as it were, more wonderful than it actually is. Are you are you actively like shaping the uh, experience or inventing it? Like uh, sometimes we talk about those with memories. The more you focus on a memory, the more you you're you're actually creating too. It's not just a passive act. That's a nice point. That's a nice point. And I do think. I mean, um, some of. Uh, I've forgotten. Is it was it Kevin O'Regan? Apologies if I've got the name wrong. Suggested there's a social dimension. Suggested to me on Twitter that there's a, uh, a social dimension to this. That um, I think of the child who hurts uh, herself and um, doesn't cry at first, and then sees the ah. reaction of the parent and sees yeah. maybe the reaction of the parent to the blood, and suddenly panics. Totally. And the pain seems, and then starts to enter the state of distress and pain because they see it mirrored back to them. I think there's a. I think that. We bring a whole lot of, um, I mean, a lot of the distress involved in pain, I think, is um, consequent to realization of what th this means. Yeah. Uh, I think we probably all have this experience where 
you suddenly feel you perhaps you're you're using a knife or something and you suddenly feel this sharp thing in your finger and you think oh my, i've cut myself off and you start to panic and then you look and you see that actually you only just 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 raised yourself and it wasn't it, it wasn't um serious yeah and suddenly the pain sort of goes away as soon as you realize that it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I think it's infused with all sorts of interpretation and theorizing and cognizing. And we, but we bundle it all together under this label of pain. Yeah. And then we're puzzled by the nature of this ineffable thing that we've bundled everything into. Mm. Um, uh, there's a nice analogy, which I often use, and I think it's one of the best, um, which I often quote. It's what the analogy is, but it's from Daniel Dennett uh, about money. I think it's a lovely example that goes as, Close, I think, as as, um, uh, um, as we can get to it to 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 to, a, to an analogy here, to a good analogy here. Um, you think about uh, the power of money, and, and then it uses the power. I think of a dollar bill, and the idea is that uh, for an American, I guess, the dollar bill seems to have a kind of power, a potency, a value, an intrinsic. Uh, he calls it the vim, the force, the power mm. of, of the dollar bill, which you don't sense a foreign currency having. Yeah. Um, uh, and this is this is quite natural because for someone who uses dollar bills as their natural as their as their their, their currency, they have a, an understanding of all that you can do with a dollar bill, yeah. of all that it means, of how you can use it in exchange and so on. Yeah. It becomes less and less by the second, by the way, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say a hundred dollar bill or a thousand. <laughs> um, um, or say pound for the for, for the for the British pound. The pound yeah. feels like something solid, and, and and it's got whereas the other currencies don't. Right. And they're picking on something real here because they haven't had experience with those other currencies of what you can do with them. Mm. They haven't a sense of their potency, as it were. For them, they're just things you can maybe exchange for the things that you really can do stuff with. Right. The pounds or dollars. These are the things that you're used to, and you're used to handing them over and getting things. Those are just things, alien things, as it were. They don't seem to have be imbued with this power. Yeah. Now, there isn't really any power in the thing itself. The power lies in the whole set of of of, of social conventions and and institutions that enable you to to use these in certain ways. It's all about the the relations these things bear to other things and to other and, and to other people. It's all about the social context. There. It's, it's, there's nothing intrinsic to the dollar that isn't intrinsic to the other one. But you've you, what you're doing is you're when you talk about the the vim, the power of the pound or the dollar, you're expressing your generalized sense of the potency of this this of this token of what you can do with it mm. so you're summing up all of that all of the potentialities of this thing in this note in in in, 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 in as, as an intrinsic essence yeah. but that's an illusion it doesn't have an intrinsic essence it's just your incohate sense of the, of the whole possibilities and that's very much i think how i'm inclined to think of experience we have a sense of what this state means we enter a state of pain or pleasure or whatever we, we have a sense of what this means for us mm. all the consequence of all the consequences of this state for us of the reactions that it's producing in us yeah of which we're not fully aware of but with this sort of shaping how we're aware of other things that the, the strong producing strong desires say for the state to continue or cease whatever it may be they're producing all kinds of they're, they're, they're molding us and shaping us and pushing us in certain ways and we have a sense of this but not a, an articulate sense it's just it's all of that it's doing all of that to me again right we, some we sort of encapsulate all of that in this notion of the pain the feel of the pain the essence of the pain yeah. which now seems intangible and mysterious and how do we explain it and now the idea that we can identify that essence with some particular pattern of neuron firing is ridiculous what it is what if anything if it corresponds to anything it corresponds to the whole host of effects that that pattern of neuron firing is going to have on you huh is, is the unfolding um resonance of of, of this of this state for you um, yeah. across multiple dimensions so the illusion that, that, I, that I mean is that we we're tracking something that is very very complex mm. incredible, a complex set of reactions that uh we're currently undergoing and encapsulating it in a in a word in a concept yeah and then taking that word or concept to refer to something 
singular and distinct and mysterious. Hmm. Okay, so the, the 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 concept is useful because because it's helping us track these real states that we're in. Where it becomes a problem is when we take it too seriously as a single unified thing, an essence that then needs explanation yeah. over and above the, the reactions that are actually being tracked. Well, uh, that's this is scary. Um, that it's convincing. It's 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 good. Um, but I, I wonder is is there still a self that's doing the the molding uh, and shaping? I, I've written relatively little about the self, but I'm I'm inclined to say something very similar about that. Okay. But again, talk about the self is it's a way of encap. I think a lot of this is a lot of our problems about the mind, our puzzles about the mind, are rooted in communication mm. because we our concepts of the mind, I think, are designed for communicative purposes. Mm -hmm. You don't need to know everything about me, but it is useful to know what kind of state I'm in generally, yeah. know whether I'm in pain, pleasure, whether I, whether that tastes good or tastes bad. It's really useful for you to know that because then you can adjust your own behavior and plan accordingly. If, I, if it tastes bad to me, maybe it'll taste bad to you. So it's useful to know that. You don't need to know the details. And so our mentalistic descriptions are very, very schematic. But they're good enough for the purposes, um, for communicative purposes. And in fact, if they were more detailed, they would be less good for those things. You don't need to know the details. Uh, yeah, and, and, and they wouldn't be as rich. And well, it, that's like someone over-explaining a joke, or uh, that's what the Continentals maybe may say about the analytics or something. Yes, yes, I think so. And, and you, you don't need to. If I started describing all the reactions that. The, in, an injury had caused to me insofar as I could describe it. And I say, oh, it's, it's making me, you know, it's making me um, uh, 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 believe that I'm, that something bad has happened to me. It's making me want this state to, to, to end. It's, it's evoking memories of times when this happened before. It's, it's make, uh, I, I, it's producing um, worries about how I'm going to be able to do um, the things that I've promised to do. To, and it, I started describing, oh, you don't need all that. I just <laughs> in pain. Yeah. Got it. And that's, that's that sums it all up. It's potent. It's simple. It's it 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 it, it gets the message across. So it's very useful. Just and I think crucially. So we have these concepts. We have these ways of of describing our own uh, condition. Let's say, which we use in communication, and then we also use these in self description. We conceptualize ourselves in the same terms we use. Uh, yeah. to communicate with others and so we build this picture of our own minds um that is uh grounded in a set of concepts really designed for the purposes of communication uh, and so we we sort of create what are I'm, I'm hesitant to use this word but i think it will do fictions mm -hmm. create fictional fictional simplifications and again that's not to do to um to disparage this because Fiction can be a very useful way of conveying truth. Some people say even more so. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Poetry, it, it, it can distort things, simplify things, change things, but convey important things that couldn't be conveyed more uh, that couldn't be conveyed as well or as effectively by a longer prose description. Right. Okay? It gets to the, the point of it. Now, I think the self is something similar. So what is this? Well, to start, there's this body that's been continuous with the body that's been around for oh, quite a long time now, and that used to be a lot younger and has got a lot older and more gray and with less hair and so on, and less agile and so on. So there's this body that, that's been persisting through time, and the capacities and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, abil abilities and skills of this body are kind of continuous too, although they've changed, some have improved, some have degraded, and so on. So yeah. you, you've got this sense of this, this, this person here. Um, but also, I can tell you a story about, about this, this body can tell you a story about, about its own inner life, about its thoughts and its feelings and its emotions and so on, hmm. using these same concepts we've been talking about. And I say, this is, this is what it's like to be me. This is my inner life. This is the self. This is, and so again, it's a way of telling a story about the capacities and the, um, the, the way this, <laughs> this body interacts with the world, has, has interacted with the world and the way it conceptualizes its own interaction with the world. Yeah. 
in terms of a persisting <clears throat> essence inside itself, the self that has continued here th throughout the, um, the 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 um, um, the the history of this body. Yeah. Okay, and that's where we attach the idea. Again, it's very, very useful. That's how I think of myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how I think of myself. That's the concept of self that I use when I talk, when the body, now you see, it's very hard to say what I want <laughs> to say without using the, the body talks to itself in this way, if you like. Yeah, we're back into the self-reference problem with the, and, uh, with and, the par yes, paradox. Yeah. Uh, and in a, in a sense, I am a, okay, I am a fiction that my body has created. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is again, uh, I, anyone who knows my work will know that Daniel Dennett has been, a, Dennett has been a huge influence on me and I think uh -huh. he's got so many things right. And he's, he's had so many insights that, um, I, in many ways, what I see when I'm trying to do in different ways is just to pick up on a few of these insights and just try and take them a little, a little further, add a little bit to, um, um, maybe take the, take another step with some of them. One that he uses, which I really, one, one idea that he has is that um, uh, the self as what he calls the center of narrative gravity. I mean, mm. the idea is here, I'm, this body is continually pro continually producing stories about itself, continually making reports. Is this the multiple, the multiple drafts? Is this? It's connected with the multiple drafts. It's how okay. you get a sense of, 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 of unity from the multiple drafts. Gotcha. So the idea is you keep asking me questions, say, what's, what, how are things with you, Keith? How, 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 what are you thinking now? What are you feeling? What are you, what are you seeing? What are you tasting? What are you, all the time we're asking each other these sort of things. And the body <laughs> comes out with, with, with statements. Uh, I'm feeling a bit, uh, feeling a bit poorly, feeling a bit queasy. I want something to eat. I'm, uh, oh, I've just had a great idea. And, and I produce all these, the body produces all of these things. And the body also uh, uh, asks itself questions. What, what, what did I do all right there? Was that was that good? Did I did I mess that up? Did I did I stumble? Did I say the right word? Uh, what do I want to eat? What should I say? What should I choose in the menu? Uh, mm. What am I going to do next? How shall I plan this? We continue. The bodies are continually questioning and con and continually producing answers. Oh, I'll have that, I'll have that one. Uh, you know, I can I can do it on Thursday. I, um, I must focus on 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 finishing that thing. And so on. there are all these stories, these narratives being produced by bodies, and they all have uh, they they have a a pronoun, an I in them, mm -hmm. um, or, or a you in the questions and an I in the answers, and the self is just whatever that refers to. Um, where this needn't be an actual thing. Mm. Think about a a story that's told in the first person, but is written by a, a, a fictional story that's written in the first person. Yeah, like um, Moby Dick, say, uh, "Call me Ishmael." Right? So it's written in the first person, but by not it's not not autobiography. Yeah. Who's the I? It's a character in the story. Mm -hmm. uh, so the I is a character in this body's story. Yeah. Well, so I wonder, I wonder, um, there's two related problems and I'm still trying to suss them out and, and see how they're different, but mm -hmm. there's like, there's the binding problem in, uh, you know, cognitive science and, uh, the unity of consciousness or unity of phenomenal consciousness, depending on who mm -hmm. you ask, um, in, in film mind, <clears throat> what, what is that? What you're saying? It's not a thing. It's a, it's a fiction. It's a narrative. Um, I that maybe we reflect on, but what is doing that work? Because in in uh, looking at this yellow, like I'm, it's it's an illusion, but it's useful and it's good. And illusions aren't always bad, but there's something that is like unifying my experience, right? Your reactions are certainly being unified in some way, okay. um, so that if you 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 can you can uh, uh, manipulate the thing, you, you can use visual information to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to, 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 to um, uh, um, visual and tactile information yeah. uh, can all be deployed in a smooth, uh, uh, um, a coordinated way. And yeah. somehow that's being achieved, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for neuroscientists to tell us how that is happening. Um, uh, and of course, it can go, it can, these things can break down. Um, yeah, for you know, sure. Associations where where you can't do these things, and, and this this is what really gives us insight into how it, it's normally achieved, how how the unity is normally achieved. 
Um, now, how is this coordination of abilities affected? Well, I say that's a, that's an empirical question, question for neuroscientists. Mm -hmm. What I don't think it involves is um, something like an inner world of um, discrete experiences that are somehow projected to an inner self and which are kind of coordinated in a private inner world. That isn't mm. necessary. That sense of the private inner world in which all these things are coordinated is a consequence of our abilities to coordinate. Yeah. It's because we can manipulate things and use different uh, and, and deploy different uh, sources of sensory information uh, and focus them in that way that we think there is a unif that there is there is an object presented to us internally like that. It's a consequence of the abilities, not an explanation of the abilities. Hmm. It's a way of conceptualizing our abilities. Okay. Um Aren't that there? Was, that, was, that was very, very brief. I, I know that was unpersuasive, but that's the way I would want to go if I got a more careful presentation. Yeah. yeah. No. This is this is great. And, and uh, folks, again, uh, this is a, it's a podcast conversation. So uh, Dr. Frankish has has written the stuff out in in papers and and like you said earlier, you you haven't um, focused as much on the on the self part of things yet. Um, uh, are you you did deal with this a, a bit in the in the paper that I've been referencing, but. I'm, I'm sure if someone has uh, in the audience has thought of this. Are we all just philosophical zombies then that are under the illusion of having qualia experiences under the illusion of having a unified field uh, of the, the illusion of having a self or being a self? Uh, for, you see, zombie is a great word because um, uh, when philosophers introduce the, the term zombie, they say, of course, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, zombies are creatures uh, that as you'd said, that don't, uh, they're imaginary creatures that don't really have this inner life, uh, that, mm. that, that, that this, this, this mysterious private inner world, though they believe they do. Okay, they're under the illusion that they do. So I, I, I am saying that in that technical sense, we are philosophical zombies. But of course, the word zombie conjures up images of creatures who are uh, uh, incapacitated in all sorts of ways that have all sorts of deficits mm -hmm. that comes up the idea of Hollywood zombies. Now, of course, philosophers who use the term are very, very careful to say, of course, I'm not talking about Hollywood zombies who are kind of dead inside. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about ones who are completely <laughs> alive from a behavioral perspective and yeah. whose brains work just like ours and who react in every possible way, just as we do, but somehow don't have this inner world. So the inner lights are off. But you, when you spell this out, when you think about what it would be to be a zombie, remember zombies react exactly as we do, and they react to themselves exactly as we do. Right. They tell themselves the same stories about themselves that we do. They conceptualize their own inner lives in the same way that we do. They have exactly the same reactions that we do, including psychological reactions in a, in a functional sense. They're aware of their own reactions. They conceptualize their own reactions in the same way. Mm. There's no de possible detectable difference between a zombie and uh, a non-zombie. Right. No difference that they could detect in any um, um, uh, by any objective <laughs> means. Right. Um, there's a lovely <laughs> paper which I often quote by, um, which I often refer to by uh, Alan Cotterell. I think he's an economist. Um, called sniffing on the conceivability of zombies, and he asks it um, asks sniffing the camembert. I think it's called on the conceivability of zombies, and he asks you to imagine a, a, a zombie who has some insight into its own condition. Mm -hmm. So it kind of the inner lights are off, um, and it's aware that they're off. Yeah, as a normal zombie wouldn't, as a regular zombie wouldn't be, because they're uh, indistinguishable from us. And so this zombie says things like, um, well, um, you ask it what it's experiencing, and it gives you the most detailed report of what it can see. Uh, it's looking at a sunset, and it describes the sunset in all of its detail and beauty, the colors and the, mm. the, uh, the way that the, the light is um, filtering through the leaves of the trees and the uh, and the, the the richness and the vibrancy of the whole thing, and the, exactly like a, a beautiful poetic description of it all. Yeah. But then adds, 
Mind you, of course, I'm not seeing this. <laughs> it's all just sort of coming to me somehow without consciousness. Now, the thought is, if all of that detail was coming to you in some way, then why isn't that enough? Why isn't that all there is to consciousness, that, that detail coming to you somehow? Yeah. And enabling you to produce these kind of reports to yourself and to, and, and to others. So, but well, yes, we, we, is that in the technical sense that pe that that um, that philosophers want to define zombies, um, then I I, 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 I I am saying we're zombies, but I, I I don't like the word. I would say something like we are exact duplicates without the phenomenal essence, without the supposed phenomenal essence. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> I I always took it to be like there's there's nothing that it's like to be a philosophical zombie. Um, but there is something it's like to be me, but you're saying that that's something it's like, is just an illusion. So does that mean that a, a philosophical zombie could have something it's like, but it's just an, it's illusory. It would think there was something it's like to be, it, it would, it would use the same terminology that we do, that we do. Yeah. I mean, I'm not suggesting that when we talk about what it's like to be us, we're not referring to anything at all. But what we're, we're referring, referring to isn't, isn't, um, like veridical what it is or... like isn't what it is like this okay this what it is like talk isn't underwritten by some qualitative essences that are directly presented to us in a private mental world it's underwritten by a whole pattern of interaction with the world that's what we're tracking when we talk about what it's like when we say this is awful we're tracking the way we're reacting to the world way, way okay. we're interacting with the world and that's real definitely yeah what so I'm not saying, you know, when you say it's like something to be you or that, 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 that that's awful. I'm not saying, oh, you're wrong. No, I, I, start, I agree. <laughs> right, absolutely. Yeah, we're we in some state that you don't like being in and it's the one you yeah. described like that. And that's fine. And I know what you mean. And I agree. And it's real. What I objecting to is, if you like, reifying that talk of what it's like and treating it as a thing, as a what it is likeness that mm -hmm. you are somehow privately aware of, yeah. which is and ex something extra over and above all the patterns of reaction, with the, the interaction that you have with the world. In a way, I'm treating it as more real mm -hmm. than, uh, uh, it, it, take the, 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 the dollar bill, the pound again. The pound, pounds and dollar bills do have power, but they have that power, not in virtue of some intrinsic vim or force or value, but in <laughs> <Yeah>. virtue of <laughs> what they can do, of how, of the context in which they're embedded. And that's yeah. very much how I see, how I think we should understand talk of, of what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. So I'm tempted here to say, well, the, the reason that, that the, the Vim has any, there is any Vim. Well, maybe Vim's wrong. Maybe Vim is the intrinsic, uh, the reason yes, that exactly. the, the, the pounds do have power, uh, sans mm -hmm. a Vim is because persons, uh, have socially constructed this dollar bill to have a certain yeah. thing, but persons are also what are socially or what are constructing uh, the qualia experience of this yellow highlighter. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm following you, but I still think you get illusionism concerning phenomenal properties. If you have a self who's doing the unifying, it doesn't have to be a self. It could be. Look, what's the what's the an analogy for the, the the economy, as it were, in which from from the, the economic system from which the the, the dollar bill gets its potency, mm. from embedding in from the embedding in which it gets its potency. Well, for, to start with, it's the economy of the brain itself. The brain is doing all kinds of. It, it's getting certain <laughs> signals. It's entry. Let's say there is at the root of this some particular pattern of neuron firing in a visual cortex, which corresponds to uh, uh, the experience of yellow. That in itself isn't doing anything, but it's what it's doing to the rest of the neural economy. Yeah. Okay. Now it's it, well, it, it's sort of it, imagine it's like it's like someone standing on the in a. I'm, I'm trying to think of an analogy here off the top of my head. It's like someone. Um, standing in a newsroom, say, and shouting out something like, you know, there's been a murder or something. And everybody in the newsroom starts reacting to that. Yeah. Some people start, you know, rushing off to take photographs and others start writing up reports and some sends out a, a, you know, a, a reporter or whatever it is. And all sorts of stuff starts happening when this person shouts out there's been a murder. That's like the neural state shouting out there's something yellow there. All sorts of stuff starts happening within that and that ramifies in all sorts of ways and then ah. some of it gets expressed externally in the people you know i don't know if i uh, stress this analogy but people run out and they have effects on other organizations outside there um 
the, you know, the police and the, and the whatever, and they react to, and then how the police react also becomes part of the news story. And yeah. it ramifies and ramifies. So this, so we issue reports on, you know, I'm seeing something yellow and other people uh, react to that and we react to their reacting to it. And so there's this internal economy, then there's a, a wider social economy beyond that. And all of this is triggered by this event in my in my visual cortex, say. Yeah. And it's all of that significance that we bundle up and say, oh, that's the feel of seeing yellow. Because we're aware of what that significance is. We've tracked it. We've noticed the significance. Um, we've, uh, we, we recognize when we enter this state and we anticipate all of that significance. Yeah. And similarly with pain. Now, pain is perhaps a better example though rather than yellow. You know when this state happens, oh my God, it's all of that again. Uh -huh. It's all of that again. Oh, and that's the pain. <laughs> it's the, all of this. And I don't think this is, although I call it illusionism, uh, uh, because I think that the, 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 in, the intrinsic pain, the vim is illusory. The, the thing that we're actually tracking here isn't illusory. In fact, it's, it's very, very real and more real than the intrinsic phenomenal properties are on... Um, Hang on. Uh, there the are many. The, the problem if you if you if you treat these properties as intrinsic as um, uh, essences, then there's a problem uh, of explaining how they really matter or do anything. Hmm. There's a danger they become epiphenomenal because all your reactions seem to be explained in terms of what's happening in your brain. You don't seem yeah. to need this extra essence. Just as all the power and potency of the dollar bill is explained in terms of the the, the economic um, context. Yeah. So. <laughs> It, there's a danger that in reifying this as, a, as treating this as as as, as a as a an irreducible essence, you're making it less important. Yeah, that that that's what uh, Frank Jackson's uh, original argument was saying, like in the Mary case, that these were epiphenomenal qualities. That mm, uh, exactly, and, and that's that conclusion. Yes, and that's why he he stepped back from it because he thought mm. you know this was just kind of crazy to to say that. Yeah, that's so interesting. I, yeah. So and, and this. Again, let me come back to why I think illusionism is a good term. I know people press me on this, and people, even people <laughs> who agree with it say, well, I, I kind of agree with you, but I don't like the term. I think it's misleading. But I like it because illusions are potent things. Mm. Uh, 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 an illusion uh, particularly uh, can have a powerful effect on people, particularly on people who don't realize it is an illusion. Sure. Um, uh, wars and religions and things have been started because of illusions. And Sometimes the, the effects have been, have been uh, uh, sometimes have been bad. Sometimes they've been good. But an illusion affects you. It mo moves you. Yeah. And you know you want to run out and tell people about it. And that's I think what the, the brain is. The brain is. I I mean, there's a way of developing this this view, and it's it's a way that um, Nick Hump, Nicholas Humphrey, the uh, psychologist, has developed, on which this illusion is actually a very adaptive one. That mm -hmm. nature has honed in on precisely because of its effect on us, that yeah. it makes us more engaged with life and world and with our own existence. Hmm. If you think you have this 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 soul within you that is very metaphysically special, then that enhances your sense of your own of the importance yeah. of your own life and of the lives of other creatures around you. Yeah. So you think it it, it has actually been? It's not just uh, um, a uh, sort of, sort of uh, error that is actually a very adaptive feature of human uh, psychology. Yeah. Well, so I so I I like um you, you mentioned how illusions can be good in the beginning. You, mm. you just said it again here. Um, but then you know we're kind of pulling back the screen and seeing seeing that uh, you know the wizard is actually just uh, a guy you know in inside the thing. I, initially, when you were you're talking about this, I thought of Planet Earth and how beautiful Planet Earth is, the final product. And then I thought of uh, the, some of the pictures you see of a guy in a, in a really cheesy looking uh, swan outfit in the swamp, you know, and he's taking pictures and he's filming and stuff. Um, are we still able to have this? This? I, how have you not just popped the bubble, I guess? Yeah, we, we go, you know what I'm saying? Does it, does it, we're learning about ourselves in this way. And we, we come to see that illusionism, uh, our mind, if illusionism is true, then our, our brains are giving us this illusion for certain effects. But then we come to learn that about ourselves. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like it seems like you might just pop the bubble and mess with our our psyches I, here. I, I don't. I don't. I, I really don't see this worry. In fact, the, the danger is that 
as we, as we just said a moment ago, that if you don't pop the bubble, if you insist on treating this thing as something that actually has to be part of reality, then you're going to find it hard to integrate it with the rest of your story about how the world works. There's a danger mm. that it's going to become, a, if you insist that there has to be this stuff, then you have this question, well, so what effects does that have? And yeah. there's a danger it's going to become epiphenomenal. So the cost of making it real is... Uh, Maybe making it ineffective. I mean, suppose somebody's been, I don't know, I've been reading that, say, the Sherlock Holmes stories and really like the Sherlock Holmes stories, sure. love them. And, so, uh, and then you say to them, well, of course, Sherlock Holmes, and they thought he was real and he really existed and there was, he really lived at that address in London. And then you say, oh, you know, it was just, they were just stories, you know. And the person says, oh, you, you popped my bubble. I, uh -huh. I, 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 was, I was so enjoyed them, but now I can't enjoy them anymore. Now, one way would be to say, say oh, actually, he did exist. Uh, it's just that he left no records and mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, there's no, nothing about him in the history books and there never was this place. Uh, and it was all sort of hidden in a, in a magical world somewhere that yeah. was separate from the real world, but he did exist. Well, that's small comfort. I mean, <laughs> it's like, like the Harry Potter world that somehow exists in the, in the, in the, in the uh, sort of gaps between the real world. Well, that's not, that's not what you want. You wanted him to be part of the real world. Well, why isn't it? Now, I don't, so I don't think there is an option to treat, you know, treating these things as real in the face of all the evidence that they're not yeah. isn't, isn't, isn't a good option. Okay. So what you've got, you've got this, you've got three options. You can say, um, uh, this stuff is real, but it's kind of so isolated from the rest of reality that it's not, it's not really doing anything. You could say it's not real and the world's miserable and dull place and uh, it's, it's all flat and it's just the man in the swamp or whatever. Or you could say, well, it's not real in the way that you thought it was, in the naive way you thought it was. Mm -hmm. But the talk of, of our talk of it is capturing something real, just as poetry and fiction and drama is capturing something real. Hmm. The talk is useful and meaningful and important, and we shouldn't give it up. Yeah. But we shouldn't. And it's perfectly consistent. that The reality and importance of it is perfectly consistent with everything that science says. It's not threatened. It's not threatened in, in the way that if you really want, if you want to be a realist, then you, you're going out on a limb and you're threatening, uh, you're running the risk of being falsified hmm. and your position collapsing back into this one, to the yeah. one that you really don't want. You can say it's not quite what you thought it is, but it's still real and potent. And the effect it had on you is every bit as meaningful as you thought it was. Hmm. Not sure I was terribly articulate there, but the idea no, is that no, that's good. insisting on realism is. I, 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 let me make a comparison with 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 religion. I'm not a very religious person. I suppose I, I would say I'm an atheist. Yeah. Um, and certainly there's, I, I, uh, the, uh, there are many aspects of religion that I think have been harmful, but at the same time, I see there's an immense amount of um, uh, nourishing and important and valuable stuff in religious traditions. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do with that in the face, if you, if in the face of a modern scientific naturalistic worldview, do you say uh, we either have to deny? Do we, we have this conflict? We either have to deny science and say that science is incomplete and 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 inadequate, or do we have to just give up the religious religious thing altogether and just cast it all away and throw it all all away? Well, there's another option, which is to say, well, look, maybe we don't treat it literally. Mm -hmm. Uh, or not all of it literally, but we still see it as an immensely important expression of things that are very, very important to human beings. Yeah. I, I think, well, I, I think that's what, that's what Jordan Peterson does. Um, I think actually uh, your, your, sure. your, your colleague, uh, Philip Goff, I think he is a, is a practicing agnostic or something. He doesn't mm. believe in God. And I believe he still goes to church. I think he said that on our podcast before, but what, what, what I think a lot of people are, are, and maybe myself included here about illusionism is like, in popping the bubble, um, there, it doesn't come with the same comforts. Um, you don't get to like 
continue to have the cake if you've eaten it because um, certain things that I do in my religious life uh, where I, you know, I have trust in God or I have faith that, that he exists. And if I were to have faith as if he existed or I don't really believe in him, but you, you see how they would, it would change the dynamic. It would change the values or the value that I get out of uh, religion if I didn't think it was true, but acted as if it was true. Yes, I, I, I suppose this is easy for me to say as somebody who doesn't come from a mm. uh, religious background. Um, and it's just an analogy that you're using, too, I, so we don't we don't have to go full down I, if you don't want. The thing is, I think what I would what I would try to say is, and I, I don't want to seem dismissive and, and sympathetic, but I, what does treating it as true really involve? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, how much of, I guess, the supernaturalist um, uh, uh, doctrine is really essential? Mm. Um, what is it really doing for you beyond expressing something about your sense of how you relate to the rest of the world and to other people and to reality and so on? Oh, yeah. Is it, I mean, does it need, how does it need to be cashed out? I mean, nobody, I think, I guess, thinks it needs to be cashed out in some of the very naive ways in which people used to think of of, of, of gods. As, 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 as People used to think of, of, of gods, I guess, as you know, giant beings in the sky who would intervene yeah. and throw thunderbolts and things. I don't think sure. any, people think of it in that way. So they've already given up on certain, in a way, it's up to us how we interpret these things, these claims. Mm. And everybody treats, I think, I think, I think, apart from, I guess, the most fundamentalist, literalist sort of people, treat some aspects of religion non-literally, the bits that they that they just don't fit with the rest of the world. So sure. it, there's a there's a sliding scale. Yeah. And I don't see that. I mean, popping the bubble. I think that's a really a, a nice phrase, but it's one that I completely don't like because I don't <laughs> okay. think it is a matter. You see, a popping the, the popping the bubble is either all or nothing. There's either the bubble or it's popped, it's gone. I yeah. think it's more like think of like a maybe a sphere of of stone and you've chipped away a little bit. But okay, still, the mass of it is still there. Okay. Why does it have to be all or nothing? I think that's what I what I, yeah. what I would want to say. There well, are... maybe we can go with um we can go with like the the Wizard of Oz. Uh, are you familiar with Wizard of Oz? they pulling back the curtain. And... Yeah, yeah. So so they thought they saw this big screen literally of a of a a, a big face of this wizard. But when they literally, when they pulled back the curtain, they saw it was just a guy and he didn't have the power that they thought he had. Um, he wasn't going to fix their problems. And then there's this kind of nice little moral of the story where they learn things all along anyways. But in coming to find out that new information about the uh, wizard, that he wasn't a wizard, but a, a huckster, mm -hmm. they don't get to continue to have that same picture of this all-powerful wizard type thing. And I wonder if the same thing is true of illusionism where it's like, I thought that I had this unified qualia uh, experience, mm -hmm. this phenomenal mm -hmm. consciousness. But after after I come to find out that it's not there, how am I able to continue to look at it the same way? Great question. I, I think this is, I think the answer here is we don't really know. We, we, mm. we I mean, there we you find out some, the, the characters in the story found out certain things about the, 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 the guy who was producing the illusion. Yeah. Um, now, but they could have found out that the illusion was being produced by somebody who was actually pretty, still pretty powerful and could do a lot of things for them, but perhaps not everything that, it, that, 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 that they thought. That's a good point. It, 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 so there's, the more we find out about what's actually happening, and I really do trust to the cognitive sciences to tell us that, the more we'll be able to see how much our intuitive conception needs mm -hmm. revising and how much we should give up and how much we can hold on to. Okay. It's going to involve some revision. That's certain. But whether that revision is going to be one that involves the whole baby in bathwater out or okay. whether it just means a little bit of modification and we can still hang on to it, that's what we're going to have to find out. And we're going yeah. to have to see what the reality is. But my thought is that we never really, you're never worse off for having more information. Sure. Um, because then you can adjust your attitudes accordingly. And your, if this is, particularly if this is stuff that's meaningful to you i think it's much better to be informed even if that is going to 
force some revisions rather than rest on a on a, on a, on a, on, a, on on ignorance because yeah. whatever's built on ignorance is flimsy and it's at some point the, you, it's going to let you down yeah because reality, reality has a way of doing right, that to you right reality is tough yeah uh, reality is tough so it's better to 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 negotiate with reality sure. and say look i want <laughs> i want to <laughs> to have this attitude to the world can i have it hmm. and um, I think in many cases you can have quite a lot of it quite consistently with 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 with, with what our best science tells us. I mean, yeah. take free will. You maybe can't have the kinds of free will that some people want, the kind that uh, that, that, that allow you to 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 um, to, to uh, override the laws of nature, but you can hmm. still have an awful lot of self-control and autonomy. And maybe that's enough, you know? So yeah. let's do this negotiation between these two pictures. And see if we can find between the scientific picture and the manifest image, and find a place where we can live comfortably without giving up everything, but without at the same time uh, building castles in the air. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's one there's one thing that that um, I wanted to, to come back to that I meant to, I meant to talk about is, is this this idea of producing effects, and so uh, mm -hmm. the, the threat of epiphenomenalism. And in in my head, um, I'm thinking, yeah, the uh, interaction problem is uh is tricky uh for substance dualists uh there's the pairing problem there's there's lots of different problems but one one thing i think a substance dualist uh emphasize well is like mental causation and i wonder um so so i'm i am well i don't know it's tricky because we have such different cons radical uh, different conceptions about selves and stuff but when I'm having a thought and I'm responding to your thought and I'm analyzing it uh with reason and such i want to think of that up in the realm of mental causation mm -hmm. um if if that's if there's physical causation that's causing me to do that it seems like my thoughts are relegated to maybe relegated it's not a nice word but i'm using it um the 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 realm of physical um explanations and so we do we still have personal explanations on this view Oh, well, actually, this this touches. I, I think we do, and I think they can be quite robust. And this actually touches on the whole other side of my of my work. But um, the first, uh, I guess, uh, fifteen years or so of my work was on the nature of conscious thought. Hmm. Um, and I had a, a a kind of dualistic picture, not dualistic in the metaphysical sense, but sure. I, I I had a picture that uh, of, of two levels uh, uh, of of um, um uh, processing if you like um two levels of thought two levels of belief two levels of of of, of decision making and the the central idea was that the level that we that we identify with the the, the level of conscious thought is personal in in, in, a, in a quite a robust sense in the sense that it's it it involves a, us doing things yeah acting and the most obvious example would be doing a say a, a mathematical problem where you actually write it out on a piece of paper and you yeah. go through the steps say a long division which mm -hmm. you cannot do in your head and so you write out the numbers and you perform you manipulate these symbols in certain ways and you come to the conclusion that's a kind of reasoning right and yeah. you get the answer and you've done it by you <laughs> the whole person yeah. okay are doing it and i think that a lot of our thinking that's not that we call thinking that goes on in our heads is very much like that it involves imagery it involves um and i can talk about imagery as an illusionist but that how i do so is another thing um <laughs> so it involves yeah. perhaps talking to yourself imagining things imagining uh, maybe imagining symbols or imagining uh, situations and, and, and asking yourself questions well if i did that if i put the chair over there would it look better or should i move the bookcase there and you can set, talk to yourself like this and then answers come into your mind mm -hmm. uh, as you um as you question yourself or you work through different steps in a, a, some sort of calculation the answers at each stage come to you now they come to you in virtue of processes that you don't have control over mm -hmm. they come to you in virtue of non-consciousness just as the when you see that as part of your doing the sum you have to add four and seven you see that that's just 11 it just comes to you you don't have to do any steps to get that the yeah. steps themselves are filled in by this more basic level of thinking which is non-conscious but conscious thinking itself is an activity it's something you do and that's really robust and um and personal and 
again, I think it's because we can engage in this kind of thing, and I can explain how this is consistent with my views about conscience, but, mm -hmm. or, uh, that we have this, that we tend to think of there being some thing, the self, that is really doing it. What's actually doing it is just, again, the body, if you like, talking to itself yeah. and constructing this sense of an inner world in which these things happen. Is... Um, so you mentioned this. This was the earlier part of your, your project. I, I assume um, you probably used language of supervenience because that was kind of that, that used to be. And did, did you talk? Does the does the top level supervene on the bottom level? And if so, um, it seems like the mathematical equation. Though I'm I'm uh, I think I'm going through this process of mathematical uh, reasoning. It's 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 uh, dependent on like the laws of neurochemistry instead of the laws of uh, mathematics? My my ability to do these things certainly depends upon my brain being able to do things. You know, sure, I mean, sure. It yeah. Well, me being able to Agreed, move yeah. my hand and right. having memorized the, 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 the procedure, and yeah. being able to recall that procedure and execute that procedure just in the way that my being able to ride a bicycle depends upon my brain having said. But sure. there are certain abilities that I have, abilities yeah. to create symbols or imagine symbols and manipulate those symbols. And those depend upon my brain doing stuff, just as my ability to walk and talk and ride, <laughs> say, ride a bicycle or do anything does. Totally. So there's no threat there to the integrity of, 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 of there being my actions. Everything that I do depends on my brain doing stuff that I'm not aware of. I mean, I'm talking to you now, and it's definitely me who's talking. It's no one mm -hmm. else. But these words are not being pre-planned um, by uh, some inner self that is then, uh, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like I've... I've pre-written a script in my head you can tell um and that i'm reading it out it's my brains thank god is 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 is, is putting these words in my mouth well so blame my brain if you don't agree but yeah. i mean everything that i do it uh, comes down to spontane to uh, the, uh, the, um ultimately to spontaneous processes i mean i can do considered things like the steps in the, the uh, in the in the arithmetic but each step itself has to be spontaneous i can't mm. think and plan every step because the thinking and planning mm. would itself have to be thought and planned. And so you'd be back into, so it all depends on our brains ultimately equipping us and enabling us to just act and just do stuff. Mm. That's how yeah. we exist. Um, but then we, because we can do kind of reflective stuff and we can, um, we can do stuff in our imaginations. Um, we tend to think that there is a, there is an inner self that is pre-planning this. Yeah. But that again is part of the illusion. But, it's getting at something that, that getting at real abilities we have. Yeah. Ultimately, the core of this, I think, is our ability to talk to ourselves. And hmm. I think this originated this 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 idea of ourselves as having an inner world is a consequence of our talking to others about our own condition, about our yeah. describing ourselves first of all to other people, and then internalizing that and seeing ourselves as other people see us as some sort of agent within ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's really that's really good. I, I think that I'm I'm still a little hung up on and and I'm sure we're not gonna solve this today. Um it, it, maybe you've solved it, but but uh, I'll need some time to, to chew on it as well. But um when I do when I add two and two, well, that's so easy that we, we kind of just but if I add two hundred and fifty six plus three hundred and seventy nine and I and I do the equation, I come to see that it seems like that's a uh uh it's in a different it's in a realm of personal explanations and uh, uh, like mathematical reasoning, that's not. Even though there is interaction, there there is inner um, action potentials coming through, and there's you know uh, all the syn synapses are firing and such. It doesn't seem like the synapses are causing me to uh, make that inference. It seems like the actual equation and doing the math is what's causing me to see the conclusion. So even if it is undergirded by this physical process, it's not the physical process that is um, giving giving those personal explanations. Does that well, is that coherent at all? It's 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 all again because it's all embedded in a context. Remember, I mean, if you just took yeah. the sort of the neurons that were involved in that and sort of cloned those neurons in a in a, in addition and got them to fire, that wouldn't do right. anything. It's the fact it's it's how they are hooked up, how these processes are hooked up to the rest of your cognitive activity and okay. to the way you're embedded in the world mm. and to how you react then to what you've done because you 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 do these symbol manipulations and whatever and you come out with the thing and then you look at it and you think yeah that's okay i'm happy with that and you know it's all part of an ongoing story that you were, yeah. you had a problem you did certain things 
you got you arrived at a certain um, with a certain result, and you felt that that fitted the problem that answered the problem that you started with. You addressed yeah. that, and so you moved on with it and used it. Hmm. It's I, I mean. <laughs> There are neurons that are, you know, making you, uh, enabling you to ride the bicycle, but, you know, you still are riding the bicycle and you, you recognize your success as a whole in doing that. Mm. It's really what this is, is taking seriously, I think. Sim as I see, what I'm saying here is just taking seriously the idea that we are just part of the physical world, that yeah. we are just very complex physical systems. Right. And, and what fascinates me, I, I guess, is that we don't, and this is this is again a, come, where the word illusion come, comes in because I'm not one of those people who I'm not the sort of physicalist who says, "Oh, we're just physical systems. We're just we're just neurons firing and you know uh, <laughs> uh, physical you know, just clusters of 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 of, 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 of uh, complex arrangements of atoms just obeying mechanical laws and just we're just robots and right. so on. And so on. I, I, because that just misses everything that's important. What's wonderful about us, and, and this is a it's 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 due to um, natural selection, is that we we are we're not just matter. We're matter that's been sculpted hmm. by billions of years of natural selection to do amazing things. Hmm. Nature has found out all kinds of tricks to produce wonderful effects, and we are the inheritors of all these wonderful effects. And they're so wonderful that when we think about ourselves, we can't believe we are what we are <laughs> because we are so amazing and we yeah. are amazing. And that's, you know, but we don't have to sort of take that amazingness literally. We don't, hmm. we don't have to take the effects. Um, uh, um, uh, we can still see behind the effects, see how the effects are created. And that doesn't diminish them though. In fact, okay. that, that increases my wonder at how nature has, has managed to, to, to create them. Yeah. Uh, it's like saying, it, it, to me, it's exactly like saying the Mona Lisa is just paint. Hmm. It is just paint. What else is it? It's not something extra. It's not got an essence of uh, something. It's not like Leonardo could have, you know, just, you know, to, to put all the paint there and it not being the Mona Lisa. That's all it is. Yeah. But it's paint put, put together in wonderful ways that create a wonderful effect on us. And hmm. we are not just neurons. We're neurons put together by uh, this uh, astonishing process that has, that has continued for thousands of millions of years, billions of years. Yeah, well, we're wonderful. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I I really like I really appreciate your perspective on that because um, yeah, like you said, there's 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 some who are really dour and really uh, they 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 go in for like really hardcore debunking and look at how oh, yeah. we we've thought this and and it's it's it's. It's cool to see because uh, maybe this is my own my own uh, preconceived notions and stuff, but uh, you got this kind of whimsical uh, illusions are great and let's let's keep going in for it. We don't have to diminish ourselves just because of this of this view. I, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, exactly. So uh, uh, this, illusions are wonderful mm -hmm. things. I, yeah. I love illusions. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Frankish, man, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you making some time to, to school me on this. You give me a lot to, to chew on here. Um, I, I'm looking forward to, to diving into some more of your work, especially some of your older work on uh, on thought as well. That's, I, I really uh, love chewing on that stuff. So thanks so much for, for your work. Thanks so much for your time. Um, people can find uh, more from you at uh, MindChat. That's here on, on YouTube or um, uh, it's on uh, Spotify and all the other ones as well. Everywhere you're finding my podcast, you can find theirs. Uh, is there is there any other place, uh, Dr. Frankish? I have your website that I'll put in the description. My well. website is is the best place. Okay, okay. It's keithfrankish dot com. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks well, again for for your time. Thank and you. For this great it's been a great conversation and great questions. I really really stimulating. Yeah, thank you. I Enjoyed it. it. Awesome. Well, folks, that's gonna have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory 